Hey, everybody. Um, OK, cool. You can hear me. Uh, thanks for having me here, and thanks for uh, joining. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about how cybersecurity enables blockchain applications and how you can use blockchain to build cybersecurity products and marketplaces um, and advance cybersecurity interests as well. But the, the core thing that I'm getting at here is nothing that you build on top of blockchain is really viable if the security um, isn't solid. So I'm going to, we're going to take a dive a little bit at the beginning of this presentation, diving into some of the vulnerabilities that we've seen in various layers of the blockchain stack uh, and see where people went wrong and perhaps how we can do better in the future. And then in the second part of the presentation, I will be uh, taking a look at what you can use blockchain for in order to build uh, cybersecurity products and services. So first part here, okay, here we go. Why is this not working? Okay, so let's talk about security enabling blockchain. So like I said, uh, we're gonna take a look at some of the different layers in the blockchain stack. So starting from the top, uh, we're gonna take a look at some Ethereum smart contracts. Um, a, lot of, a lot of blockchain technologies, a lot of blockchains uh, nowadays support the notion of smart contracts, but Ethereum is definitely the most widely used and also most often exploited. Uh, so we'll take a look at a few examples there. After that, we'll talk about blockchains themselves, uh, exchanges that make blockchain uh, viable for the vast majority of people, um, software and hardware that you use to access blockchain applications, and uh, then we'll we'll move on to the second part of the talk. So. Let's start at the top, so smart contracts. So a lot of things have gone wrong with smart contracts in the past, and one of the things I wanna drive home with this presentation is um, we need better tooling. Uh, we need safer languages, first and foremost, I would say, um, to remove some of the foot guns um, associated with building smart contracts. So let's take a real quick crash course on Ethereum. Um, so Ethereum supports this notion, like I said, of smart contracts where you can not only send cryptocurrency between people, but you can also write programs that, effect, that execute on the blockchain that govern how uh, funds are allocated or taken and, and moved and things like that. So um, this is, these are actual programs that are running in this distributed network actually computed by the miners in the Ethereum blockchain uh, in exchange for reward, namely, gas um, is what it's called in Ethereum. So much like you need gas to run a car, you need gas in Ethereum to execute smart contracts. So um, that's, that's kind of the high level here. So let's take a look at, um, so all, all of these contracts are defined uh, by the Ethereum yellow paper. For some reason they made it yellow. I'm not really sure why. Uh, I want to be a little special, but um, there's a specification for these contracts, and these contracts, they're written typically in a high-level language called Solidity uh, and compiled down into EVM, or Ethereum Virtual Machine, bytecode. Uh, and that EVM bytecode is actually what's executed by um, the, the Ethereum nodes that are making up the network. And there's a little example of some bytecode there that's been disassembled. And you can think of it the same way as x86 or ARM or uh, maybe even Java bytecode uh, that somebody's taking a look at and trying to reverse engineer and find vulnerabilities in. So, so Solidity in particular, again, that's the most popular high-level language for coding Ethereum contracts right now. Um, Solidity's had a number of issues in the past where it made it effectively very easy to build vulnerabilities into these smart contracts. Uh, there's efforts underway right now to replace Solidity with something called Viper, uh, which draws its name from Python. It's trying to be Python-esque, and it removes a lot of the uh, pitfalls that you would have uh, with Solidity, so you can produce um, uh, you know, more secure contracts without thinking about it. So let's see. So I'm gonna run through a few examples here of some smart contracts that have had issues in the past. Um, this one I, I very much like because it actually demonstrates something that Solidity fixed. Um, so again, moving towards safer languages and fixing uh, and removing different ways for a language to uh, allow developers uh, to build in vulnerabilities is really what we should be moving toward, right? Addressing specific vulnerabilities uh, is kind of a game of whack-a-mole 
um, if you're familiar with that game. Uh, you know, there's fires popping up all the time and you're just putting one out at a time. So really we need a better fire department, uh, which is a more secure language in this case. So in this example, somebody wrote a unabashedly um, pyramid scheme uh, um, in the, on the Ethereum blockchain. So there was this smart contract called Dynamic Pyramid, which did exactly what it, what it purports to do, uh, which is namely, uh, you get more people to invest in this pyramid scheme after you do, and then you get some sort of payout based on a, uh, additional people putting funds into this system. Um, so somebody copied this Dynamic Pyramid smart contract and renamed it um, to Rubixi. Uh, and Rubixi does exactly the same thing, just with a different name. And the reason why this became a problem is they failed to rename the uh, smart contract in all of the places that they needed to. So they renamed the name of the contract to be Rubixi, but the name of the um, what should be the constructor function, which is a function that is called once, uh, when you deploy the smart contract on the Ethereum chain and should never be called again, and can never be called again, to be more specific. Um, because they did not rename the constructor function to also be Rubixi, it was not considered by Solidity to be a constructor function. So it remained callable after the fact. So what does that mean? So here, here's one of the simplest uh, sort of vulnerabilities you'll see here. Um, so what you're seeing is on at the top, you have the contract named Rubixi, and then you have a function called Dynamic Pyramid, and Dynamic Pyramid, you know, that's not the same string as Rubixi, so that, that's a normal function now. And by default, in Ethereum smart contracts, normal functions can be called by anyone at any time. And this function reassigns the variable creator to whoever called that function. Message.sender is whoever called that function. So, in order to drain this pyramid scheme of all of its money, you simply needed to call the function dynamic pyramid, set yourself as the owner of the contract, and then just withdraw everybody's funds. So here's a good example. Um, and I wanted to bring this one up because this actually is impossible in Solidity anymore. So this is something that was possible, but if you're using a moderately recent uh, copy of Solidity, uh, you have to actually explicitly say which function is the constructor. So this is not a mistake you can make anymore. Um, on the note of safer languages, uh, there's a push for this in a lot of different spaces right now. So um, I'm gonna get to C++ in a little bit. C++ has a lot of foot guns as well. Um, more commodity sort of software is built with C++. We have browsers. Uh, we have, um, thankfully not kernels, that's C, but uh, even still, we have a lot of code, uh, mail clients, et cetera, that are written in C++. So Mozilla, you know, the company behind Firefox and Thunderbird, has been slowly porting over their browsers to a language that they developed called Rust. And Rust provides a lot of different promises in terms of uh, you cannot write past the end of a buffer. Uh, you cannot express a vulnerability, the like, you, you cannot express a use after free, for an example. Um, and just due to the way that their borrowing system works. So this is what we need to see more for blockchain. Uh, so show of hands real quick. Uh, has anybody here ever played the game Rocks, Paper, Scissors? There you go. Yeah, okay. Fair number of people. So uh, one, of the, one of the key aspects of Rocks, Paper, Scissors is you need to not know what the other person is going to play before they play it, right? Sounds kind of obvious. Um, somebody built a rocks, paper, scissors smart contract on Ethereum and, uh, and failed to uh, attain that objective in this game. So what happened is um, because they, they, by default in a blockchain environment, everything's public and it's public forever. And you know, there's this immutable ledger, which is great for some aspects, not great if you're trying to play a game that involves secret data. And this secret data in this case is what the other, what the other play is going to be from the other person. Uh, so in this case, if you were running in a, a full Ethereum node, you could see what your opponent played before their play was mined into the blockchain. So imagine playing rocks, paper, scissors, but you know what your competitor is going to say. <laughs> Um, so you can play the winning play every single time. So your competitor plays scissors, you play rock, bam, you win. Um, so what they didn't take into account here is the fact that, again, everything on the blockchain is public. 
Um, so, you know, having better tools in terms of keeping things private and some other, uh, not Ethereum, but, well, maybe Ethereum, I don't know, but some other um, uh, uh, blockchains are using, are building convenient sort of private labels on data that are used inside contracts to do things like a commit reveal sort of scheme. Um, so here's, here's a, I, I always bring this example up uh, because it's maybe one of the more um, prominent ones. Uh, so early on in Ethereum's history, there was this something called the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, uh, where they were trying to set up this community-owned and operated organization where people would vote on the blockchain for what this organization was going to do. Uh, its first product was building a Ethereum-backed smart lock. Um, so think like Google Nest or something, but you would send some message on the Ethereum blockchain and you'd wait five minutes for your door to unlock or something. Um, anyway, so the DAO was backed, uh, this distributed autonomous organization was backed by a contract on the Ethereum blockchain and that contract was designed to govern how this organization would operate. Um, part, of, part of this contract was it allowed people to create child companies, child distributed autonomous organizations from it. Um, and the vulnerability here was they would call, um, they use something called dot call dot value, which actually passed execution from the DAO contract to um, wherever it is that they're calling to. So if they, if they called uh, from the from the DAO into an attacker's smart contract, the attacker's smart contract would now be executing as if it was just a normal function call from you know a normal uh, program. So say your you know your your web browser calls some random untrusted code at some point. Um, that's that's effectively what's happening here. So what it, what people did to exploit this is uh, what's referred to as um, a reentrancy attack. So what uh, so people people drained the DAO for between fifty and sixty million dollars U.S. at the time, um, and the way that they did this is they continuously split the DAO, um, and they had uh, the DAO do a um, dot call dot value to their malicious contract, which called back into the split function, uh, and that split function happens before balances are adjusted. So you see at the bottom here. Um, it's adjusting the total supply and also the balances of the person calling and uh, the amount paid out. But uh, number, it's annotated as three above that. Uh, withdrawal reward four actually in that function does a dot call dot value to the um, attacker's smart contract. So what they can do is when withdrawal reward four calls into the attacker's smart contract, they just call uh, this function split DAO again and it executes again, sending them additional funds every single time. So they think of like a, a stack overflow where they're recursing, recursing all the way down, uh, draining the funds out without ever actually hitting the operative code where it zeroes out their balance, uh, ensuring that they can't do that. So another thing that's happened in the smart contract space is um, honeypots. So honeypots are, are kind of fun. Um, you know, people go out and they try to exploit uh, Ethereum smart contracts um, using things like reentrancy bugs uh, to do so. And so people have kind, kind of gotten wise to that and set up um, honeypots, which are contracts that look vulnerable, but they actually aren't. Uh, so they, they get you know malicious people on the internet to basically try to steal funds out of these contracts uh, that end up actually stealing the funds of the people that are trying to steal the funds. Um, so it's a little bit of a, you know, um, hacking back, so to say, I guess, but a, a, in, in a more passive sort of manner. Um, so there's uh, my, my coworker actually at a uh, previous Hack in the Box events, we ran a uh, competition called HODL Wallet uh, that was a um, honeypot that looked like it was vulnerable and it actually wasn't. Um, and I'm gonna, these slides are going to be available afterwards. I'm going to skim through these real quick, but happy to answer questions after on, in terms of how this works. But because um, I have a lot of slides to get through. But in some, while this does look vulnerable to the same sort of reentrancy attack that we saw before, where the withdrawal count is updated after the dot call dot value, it actually wasn't exploitable. <laughs> Um, because of the require 
uh, balances from line. So basically nobody had an initial balance aside from my coworker. Um, so nobody was ever, ever actually able to call this function and withdraw anything other than what they sent into the contract. So it was kind of zero sum for everybody else aside from my coworker um, who could always withdraw the full amount. Um, and somebody tried to, so this was deployed on the Ethereum mainnet, somebody tried to hack it within an hour. <laughs> so there's people, there's people out there scanning and trying to do this autonomously. Uh, here's another example, um, but I'm gonna skip through this a little bit. Um, this, this example, again, feel free to consult the slides later, but this example is a little bit interesting and it does kind of speak to the language discussion. Basically what's happening here is, um, uh, they called out to what purports to be a logging contract. So they, they do some innocuous sort of operations and then they log like success or something like that. Um, but they're calling out to this external contract, uh, whose source appears to be innocuous, but the bytecode behind that source actually doesn't match what is on Etherscan. Is it, has anybody taken a look at Etherscan before? Anybody here? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so Etherscan is is a blockchain explorer for, for Ethereum, and among other things, you can take a look at source code of smart contracts that are applied on the Ethereum mainnet. Um, but they're limited in terms of how they can do validation that a particular piece of uh, source code actually matches the bytecode that's on chain. Uh, namely, what they do is they, if you upload source code, you tell it which version of Solidity you use to compile the bytecode, and if it matches the bytecode that's actually on chain, then they give you a green check mark. Um, but uh, there's there's some quirks there. So they're in this particular attack, they were able to uh, get Etherscan to disagree with what was actually on the on the blockchain in terms of bytecode. So if you took a look at what was verified source, it actually wasn't the logic that was being uh, done. And in that in that log function, in that log contract was a backdoor where they just withdraw withdrew all the funds. All right, and here's another simple example. <laughs> uh, this one's a lot simpler. They just put a lot of white space in their contract so that you would have to actually scroll down in order to see the back door. <laughs> and this um, this caught a bunch of people as well. All right, uh, let's go ahead here. So some takeaways here. Um, again, by default, everything on the blockchain is public. You really have to try to make things not public. Um, and forever. <laughs> There's no perfect forward secrecy. This isn't Signal. This isn't something else. Um, uh, well, it is similar to PGP, for example, I guess. But um, yeah, so everything by default's on the on the block, or sorry, public on the blockchain. Uh, formal verification can help, but we've seen uh, so formal verification is taking source code and doing some fancy math to make sure that the bytecode that's that is spit out conforms to the developer's intentions, um, which sounds a little nebulous, probably because it is. Um, you basically have to codify your intentions very specifically, and you can't, if you make a mistake in codifying those intentions as well, perhaps you miss the bug that you put in your code. So for any non-trivial contract, um, you know, what I would recommend is you build in some sort of upgrade uh, path, uh, which is, again, not the default by any means. Um, you know, you wouldn't run a browser nowadays that had no way of updating itself. <laughs> Right? But that's effectively what you're doing when you're sending money to smart contracts in the Ethereum blockchain is you're sending money to something that might be, might be vulnerable, um, is in some cases outside of the realm of what we can verify right now, uh, and can never be up upgraded. So if something is discovered, um, you need to fork or you need to get people to move everything off to another contract uh, swiftly. And finally, safer languages make for safer contracts. So the move from Solidity to Viper is going to help with this, and we're seeing this in other spaces as well. So moving on down the chain here, um, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, so the next level is the blockchain itself. So we talked about smart contracts that are executing on top of Ethereum. Um, now let's talk about EOS. <laughs> um, is anybody here familiar with EOS? Hopefully a fair number of people, okay. A few people, yeah. So, and when you're building a when you're building a blockchain, there are a few kind of core requirements. Um, you need to be Byzantine vault tolerant, uh, which basically means 
um, uh, well, I'll quote, condition of a computer system, particularly distributed computing systems where components may fail and there is imperfect information on whether a component has failed. So you need to be resilient in the face of this, right? In a distributed environment like a blockchain environment that has arbitrary um, Turing complete execution on top of it via smart contracts, uh, you really need to take into account any particular node can turn malicious or go offline or collude with other nodes at any given time. Um, you need to build in, uh, obviously, consensus mechanisms that incentivize the same sort of behavior that you actually want to get out of the blockchain. And uh, it's really important to have a reference implementation. So, you know, there's been a lot of white papers for various blockchains. Um, not all of them have actually made its implementation, but um, uh, when you're when you're doing an implementation, you know, uh, you typically talk about resource requirement, you know, how fast is it, how much memory, how much CPU, and I would say you need to build security as a functional requirement as well. Uh, so let's talk about EOS. So EOS basically didn't do any of this right, um, so, um, but is somehow worth billions of dollars. So EOS has a governance model uh, where, you know, it's, it's uh, distributed in some senses, but not distributed in the senses that matter. Um, so EOS has a number of nodes uh, that are called block producers, and those, those block producers are the only nodes that are capable of mining or signing a block into the EOS blockchain. So um, if you want to transmit EOS uh, tokens from one person to another, these block producers at some point need to come into contact and actually sign that transaction for you. Uh, these block producers are elected by uh, token holders, so it's kind of a proof of stake in that sense where they elect these block producers. But uh, the way that this falls apart is um, these block producers kind of sign on uh, to a constitution, so to say, uh, governing how they're going to behave. And part of that constitution is a blacklist where um, if somebody's EOS account or smart contract was hacked and the attackers are trying to drain that account of all of its money and transfer it elsewhere and then liquidate it on an exchange, um, they would blacklist transfers from that account, right? So say account OX ABCD uh, was hacked, they might add that account to the blacklist so the attackers can't actually move funds out of that account, meaning the block producers will refuse to sign transactions moving funds out of the hacked accounts. Um, so this falls apart because if any of the block producers, which again are, are elected by the community on a rolling basis, I, I forget how often new block producers are elected, but if any of them get this blacklist wrong, <laughs> then that transaction might go through and this whole thing kind of just falls apart. Um, so of course this happened, uh, you know, that's not really surprising at all. Uh, so somebody stole $7 million uh, when one of the block producers didn't implement the blacklist properly. Um, in the slide notes for this, uh, there's a link to Vitalik uh, Buterin's blog on uh, perhaps some better, uh, it was actually a um, collaboration with Eamon, uh, who's the author of this tweet, um, on better Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms that can achieve 99% Byzantine fault tolerance, which is pretty cool. Um, in addition to that, so they released a reference implementation, they released the EOS client, which was written in C++, uh, which is a notoriously insecure language, um, and they opened a bug bounty on it. So um, for those of you familiar with HackerOne, that may look familiar on the left-hand side. They opened a bug bounty on this EOS client, again, for this multi-billion dollar blockchain. And within the first week of opening this bug bounty, uh, they got, <laughs> from one person, they got 12 remote code execution vulnerabilities reported. <laughs> Each one they awarded $10,000. So this one guy, uh, Guido, um, reported 10 remote code executions uh, vulnerabilities in the EOS client within the first week, any of which could be used to steal the private keys of anybody else on the network. So, you know, if he was a, a little bit more nefarious, he could have just stolen millions and millions and, you know, decimated the value of the entire blockchain. Uh, in addition to that, Kihu uh, 360 uh, reported a bunch as well, and they said, uh, well, they actually used the word decimate as well, okay. Um, that such an attack could decimate the entire cryptocurrency network. 
So, you know, it, it bears repeating, but, you know, for some reason, people don't seem to get that unsafe languages are unsafe. Um, so, you know, if you're writing something that's going to be um, protecting, um, you know, governing, kind of, you know, working with billions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency, maybe don't write it in C++, right? Uh, let's, let's move to, um, you know, nobody's perfect. People will make mistakes. Um, so let's move to something else. So some takeaways are many dimensions to a trustworthy blockchain uh, design, uh, both in terms of design and implementation, and neglecting any of them can be catastrophic. Um, and uh, rule number two, which is <laughs> rule number one uh, of cryptography, is don't ro roll your own cryptography. So EOS did this as well, by the way. Um, uh, IOTA is another great example of that if you want to, if you like cryptography and how to do it wrong. Um, okay, so moving along, uh, exchanges. So to actually use a blockchain, a lot of people need to move funds into the blockchain, out of the blockchain, and they, they accomplish this with exchanges, right? Not everyone's mining Bitcoin on their computer, you know, 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago, yeah. Uh, and this has serious world, real world implications. So there was a UN report recently where North Korea is funding its, um, uh, weapons programs to the, uh, to about the, the tune of about $2 billion via cyber. Um, and a lot of that is actually coming from hacking cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, presumably because of the language and cultural, the lack of language and cultural barrier, a lot of those exchanges have been in South Korea. Uh, but they're not only in South Korea, some have been in uh, Japan and, and elsewhere. Um, so this is, um, this is a, a serious kind of pressing issue and, you know, more of a geopolitical one than, than simply ha hacking a smart contract because this is significant amount of funds that could be falling into the wrong hands. Um, so this is BitThumb, uh, that, that was legitimately hacked. Uh, so they were, they lost around $13 million. This one, so, you know, so there's some that get hacked and then there's others that just ex exit scam. So this was a Canadian, uh, exchange where the CEO was the only one that held the private keys for the exchange wallets. And, um, uh, so he, he mysteriously disappeared. Some people claimed he died. Um, but it was investigated by Ernst and Young, uh, along with the Canadian authorities. And they found that the exchanges, uh, you know, the funds from the exchange were actually used to collateralize margin accounts for the CEO of this exchange. And anyway, this exchange went bankrupt because nobody had access to these funds aside from the CEO, which he used to just kind of YOLO gamble on the side. Um, so that's also really bad, uh, you know, from a, um, you know, this is, this is still a security issue, right? Um, you know, people need to have confidence in exchanges in order to do business in the blockchain environment. So even even though this is not really a cyber attack necessarily, it's still an attack on reputation. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not good for usage. So uh, a little bit ago, actually at, at DEF CON this year, Coinbase gave a great talk. They actually captured several Firefox uh, zero days uh, that were targeting their employees and they gave a presentation on the zero days and a little bit about how they discovered them. So, you know, if you're going to be working for an exchange, you're going to build an exchange. What exchanges need to do is a lot of defense in depth. They need to deter lateral movement. Um, if, if you're kind of the apex defender, you need to be catching zero day attacks like Coinbase is doing. Um, and what they needed to do, excuse me, in order to do that is they were gathering data proactively, uh, sufficient data. Um, that they were able to actually isolate and um, take a look at the workstations that were hit by uh, this particular uh, zero-day exploit. Uh, it was actually two. I, I believe it was a renderer and then a provisc. Um, and use hardware security modules and audit access to them. And finally, when all else fails, if you assume compromise, uh, limit your exposure, right? So, um, you know, don't keep all your funds in the hot wallet, right? Uh, transfer them to some cold storage wallet. So even if the hot wallet's compromised, um, you know, you're not totally out of luck. And finally, uh, regulation is pretty essential for trust. So 
uh, at least in the states, we have you know some very well regulated exchanges, and uh, you know. Uh, um, so anyway, that's that's essential for trust, and particularly people that are not already um, kind of motivated to be in the blockchain space in the first place, right? These are the moms and pops that want to, uh, you know, open a Coinbase account, much like a bank account sort of thing. So moving on down, uh, talking about, sorry, so talking about workstations and ecosystem, this could really be an entire talk. Obviously, this covers like the full gamut of what are you doing, what are you running when you're talking with blockchains, what is what is running on your laptop, what is running on your phone. Um, but these are all critical to um, securing this ecosystem as well. So uh, yeah, so again, this could be kind of a whole talk, but um, Trail of Bits recently was doing some great work in this space on two-factor and web auth and adding that to package managers like um, Python's pip uh, manager, or PyPy. Um, so, you know, that needs to happen in more places. WebAuthn is, you know, if you have those USB sticks, uh, you know, Google markets one called Titan, Ubico has other ones. Um, they're invulnerable to phishing because they, they're they not going to be confused like a human is, and they're not going to respond with the correct response uh, to an incorrect domain, right? So building that kind of thing into whatever web app uh, you're building, that helps. Um, reproducible builds, this is another big one. So some Linux distributions have been working on this for a while. Uh, Debian is kind of leading the charge on this front. They actually have a, a burn down chart in terms of the number of build or sorry, number of packages in their official repository that are no that remain not reproducible, <laughs> and it's going down. And uh, something like over ninety six percent, I believe, of packages are now reproducible. And what that means is, given source code and given a binary. Um, you can prove that that binary came from that source code, right? If you cannot do that, and by default a lot of software is not reproducible, then you cannot make guarantees about the binary based on analyses you do on the source code, right? So this is this is pretty critical. And one of the, you know an example here is Python bit bytecode is not reproducible, and Python bytecode is shipped in a lot of uh, Linux distributions uh, for various uh, purposes, but um, you know, reproducible builds has you know huge implications on a lot of different fronts, um, including the next item here. So, if you're doing some sort of uh, security checks, some sort of automatic or static or dynamic analyses on your source code in some continuous integration environment, if you don't have assurances that that source code matches what binaries people are actually using, then the chain's kind of broken. Right, So you can do those checks on the source code, but again, people would have to trust that the binary they're running on their system has not been interdicted, has not been um, you know, backdoored, perhaps you know, somebody compromised uh, a developer, for example, and that blends in well with the next point. Um, say somebody compromises a developer account that publishes a package that a lot of software uses. Um, they can selectively backdoor uh, the software that other people rely on, and uh, this has happened. Uh, many times. So in particular, Node or the NPM ecosystem is uh, pretty notorious for this. Uh, they're doing a lot of work to try to shore this up right now. In fact, they actually rolled out 2FA and WebAuthn. Um, but you know, they've had many problems. Um, one, uh, did, did anybody hear about Node.js's uh, left pad issue? OK, so what that was. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so what that was is, uh, so Node.js, you can use Node.js to write you know, offline applications or um, web apps that are actually hosted somewhere, um, whatever. But when you're importing libraries that other people have used for convenient functions uh, like, um, uh, you know, these functions can range pretty severely, but this one particular function that everyone was importing was left pad, which all it did was took a, took a string and added a certain amount of spaces to the left-hand side of that string. And apparently a lot of JavaScript developers opted to use somebody else's implementation of this left pad function uh, in order to actually go about doing this. So it, it's a very simple uh, sort of piece of logic. Um, but instead of writing it again, everyone just used this left pad uh, package. And this left pad package 
the maintainer uh, deleted the package, um, and every, all the other packages that relied on this one broke. And the, another problem associated with this is somebody could have republished the package in the same name, uh, a malicious package in the same name, and then backdoored all the other software that relied on that package. So there's actually a quote on this. Uh, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. So this kind of falls under the second one um, in terms of naming things. Okay, the last sort of section on this is uh, hardware devices, so um, hardware security modules um, and other devices. So this was a fun development a few months ago. Uh, Ledger, which produces um, uh, some cryptocurrency wallets, hardware wallets, they spun up a vulnerability research team, and the first thing they did was target unfixable hardware bugs in their primary competitor's products, namely Trezor. Um, so Ledger found some uh, bugs uh, in, in Trezor devices. Uh, given physical access to a Trezor, they were able to, with about $100 of equipment, extract the seed from the device. Um, and yeah, there's, um, if you're interested in these sort of attacks, I'd encourage you to take a look at the slide notes on these because uh, there's a lot of details here. But it takes less than five minutes and around $100 to recover a seed, which is um, you know, the, the random number that is the genesis of the keys that are held inside of um, that hardware security module. And in response, Trezor wrote a blog post, uh, and the picture on that blog post is literally shots being fired at them. And what they said in, in summary is they knew about this from the beginning, but they didn't actually care too much. Um, you know, they didn't think a lot of their users cared sufficiently, um, or they didn't prioritize physical attacks uh, relative to things like remote attacks. So, you know, for the devices that are currently out there, for the most part, um, you know, they're not hardened from a hardware, from a, sorry, physical access or a standpoint. So it's, that's something important to know. Um, and it's not something that's very widely advertised. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Trezor in that blog post said, uh, and you know, there's a bit of disdain probably <laughs> in the voice on this is, we would like to thank Ledger for practically demonstrating the attack that we had been aware of since designing Trezor. <laughs> um, so anyway, there's a little back and forth there. Um, but uh, so they've done a number of other awesome pieces of research. I'd encourage you to check it out. It's called Ledger Donjon, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know. Um, some other great work has been wallet.fail, which is actually a URL if you go there. Um, you can take a look at uh, some of the work that they did. Um, and I'm kind of blowing through this right now because there's, there, there's a lot of work on this front. Salim Rashid. Uh, has done some great work as well. Uh, as a teenager, he was breaking all kinds of devices. Uh, in this case, it was Bitbox. Um, so they also took a look at other um, more standard kind of HSMs, things that you might deploy in a cloud, or rather in a data center sort of environment. Anyway, so going back to this, so uh, the, the bugs that they found in this more off-the-shelf sort of HSM had memory corruption vulnerabilities that are reachable remotely in daemons that were running as root in a Linux kernel from 2009. And they had no exploit mitigations really turned on either. There was no ASLR, there was no stack cookies, there was no nothing. So this, this HSM, which they, they did not name, but it's really trivial to find out which HSM they're talking about, um, they, uh, you know, they owned it through and through. There was like eight different daemons listening, and they found uh, a number of di 14 different vulnerabilities uh, in a fully unauthent unauthenticated attack surface running as root. So here's another uh, great uh, Twitter <laughs> quote here. Uh, Tell me again how C isn't the problem. Um, so Microsoft published a, a piece of research where 70% of all security bugs, at least in their products, have been memory corruption vulnerabilities or memory safety issues more generally. Um, and uh, Matthew uh, works at Google. He's saying, no, no way to prevent this, says, say programmers of only language where this regularly happens. Um, so again, let's move to safer languages. Uh, let's not code blockchain things in C and C++. 
um, or HSMs, perhaps. So in terms of, so the kind of knee-jerk reaction a lot of times when, you know, people say, um, you know, don't you see, don't you see plus plus is what about mitigations? In the case of the last HSM that I was briefly talking about, they didn't enable mitigations anyway, but if they had, um, uh, Halvar published this great, this is from a talk that Halvar Flake gave um, some years ago, where uh, what's, what's being graphed here is the um, difficulty on the Y axis. I'm not sure why it's not labeled, but difficulty in exploiting a particular target, right? So as more research is published, as people get better and better at taking a look at a particular target, it becomes easier and easier to hack that target. Then a new mitigation is introduced and the difficulty goes up. Um, and this is what people think the effects of mitigations are, but what, what it really is, is you know the difficulty goes up and then people find a bypass for that mitigation or some generic sort of copy and paste code that they can reuse across their exploits and um, at the end of the day it's it kind of kind of evens out a bit so you know you get a you get kind of a short term bump but it's it's not a long term solution the long term solution is uh, not providing programmers with uh, the tools necessary to build in vulnerabilities uh, so the last thing I want to talk about in this section, has anybody here heard of BitFi? Yeah, okay, in the back. Um, so enough said. Um, BitFi was, it is, I guess it still exists, a brain wallet, uh, which means, so this device basically does nothing. So this device, uh, they're selling this wallet, um, which is allegedly a hardware security, you know, you know, it's a, it's, it's supposed to compete with Ledger and Trezor and things like that. What it is, it's a, it's a MediaTek Android device with the Wi-Fi and the camera removed and an app on it where you have to remember your passphrase. So really this, this device could be replaced with a Python script and people actually did that um, because there, there's nothing about your keys, your cryptocurrency keys that live on this device. Um, and um, they don't really get security in general, but uh, so they, they issued, so um, this was kind of a, a fun little Twitter saga. John McAfee, um, if you're familiar with them, was endorsing this product, uh, offered a $100,000 uh, <laughs> bounty if somebody could hack it, and uh, so somebody did, right? And their Twitter was saying, uh, rooting the device does not mean that it was hacked. Um, so I'm not really sure what hacking really means in this context, but to be fair, they updated their Twitter profile to say that social media is not checked for accuracy by their engineers. So they're good now. Um, some other research on that front. Uh, again, Salim Rashid, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly as well, and a, and a few others. So a lot of, lot of references to take a look at when these slides are published. Um, happy to chat afterward as well. So let's, let's flip on the other side now. So now that we've talked a little bit about how things can go wrong securing a blockchain sort of stack all the way from smart contracts down to the hardware, uh, what can we use blockchains for to build in the security space? So there are a few different categories uh, that I'll touch on real briefly. Um, so we can use blockchain for identity authentication and auditing, right? So there's a project called Civic uh, that's kind of a blockchain-backed identity management, KYC uh, sort of platform, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, so uh, I work for Polyswarm. The Polyswarm co-founders also work for a company called NARF Industries, which did work on a uh, DHS project for uh, building blockchain-backed identity authentication and um, basically selective information disclosure uh, using blockchain. So DHS wanted to um, uh, use blockchain to, um, uh, you know, kind of have a, uh, a bit of a better handle on their employees accessing various secure sites and selectively revealing attributes of those employees to maintain a limited need to know sort of basis. So this was for DHS's own employees going to uh, various sites and only revealing what they needed to in order to actually get access to the information that they needed. In the supply chain management area, uh, so Walmart famously uses Hyperledger Fabric to track the provenance of leafy greens. These are things like lettuce. 
Uh, they actually rolled this out. Uh, so, excuse me, uh, not too long ago, romaine lettuce in the United States and Canada was recalled um, for about a month. Um, and they, uh, but at the time, it, I don't believe Walmart was using this at the time, but the, the idea of using a blockchain to kind of track where uh, food is coming from would allow people to more quickly narrow down where, um, you know, in this case it was E. coli uh, in lettuce, uh, narrow down which farms the infected lettuce came from, and then they could pull stock only from those farms and not just pull from all of North America, right, which is actually what happened. Uh, another interesting thing, we're in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Abu Dhabi's national oil company is tracking oil movements on chain. So that's awesome. And De Beers is tracking diamonds. Um, so that's pretty cool. Another way you can go with this is creating, <clears throat> excuse me, is creating security marketplaces. So there's another project called Quantstamp, which is encouraging or incentivizing security researchers to, um, identify and report vulnerabilities in Ethereum smart contracts, and it rewards them for doing so. And then what we're building at Polyswarm is a marketplace for discovery and identif identification of new malware. Um, so I'll talk about that real quickly. Basically what happens on Polyswarm is uh, it's an economic competition where uh, antivirus engines compete to detect um, uh, malware. So an enterprise customer might upload a piece of malware and engines weigh in saying, I think this is malicious or I think it's benign. And they actually stake a certain amount of tokens along with that response. Um, depending upon if it actually was malicious or if it actually was benign, the incorrect side of the market, their, their tokens are um, taken and given to the correct side of the market, right? So it encourages people to stay on top of the latest threats and um, uh, you know, only respond when they're actually confident in something. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And uh, I have a link at the end, but um, so a few takeaways. So we need more easy to use formal verification. Uh, we need it enabled uh, via more secure languages are one way to get there. Um, exploit mitigations are a stopgap at best. Uh, we need to do more fuzz and so dynamic and static checking in CI in continuous integration, but crucially, this does not uh, displace human audits, right? Um, we need creativity, and computers are notori notoriously bad at creativity. So we need creativity to drive what the next generation of CI tests are. Um, we need to be clear about defended threat models and expressing those defended threat models in layman's terms. So. You know, at least when I was building the slide deck and I was taking a look at Trezor's website, there was nowhere at least prominent that was saying, you know, make sure you don't leave your Trezor at home or, you know, someplace at a hotel room or something that, you know, somebody might come and physically access because that is not something we're defending against. Um, we should be honest, you know, and upfront about those things and let, and let people make informed decisions. And uh, um, we need better cloud HSMs that support crypto assets, uh, so there aren't many out there. And the ones that are, uh, again, <laughs> this is not unusual. This one, this one that uh, Ledger took a look at that had a bunch of remote code execution bugs and a, a memory unsafe daemon running as root. This is unfortunately the rule rather than the exception even today. Um, we need to improve the security resiliency of our development ecosystem. So a tweet I saw right before coming on stage actually is some uh, research from the uh, Technical University in Dernstadt. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, published some research where they did a bunch of graph analyses on NPM packages, so JavaScript node packages. And they found that if you compromise only 20 developer accounts in NPM, you could take over half of all published packages in NPM. Um, so, and if you compromise that, you know, some other portion of that, you'd still take over a massive amount of the internet. Um, so we need some more resiliency there. And finally, um, blockchains hold significant promise as foundations for security uh, in terms of products and services. But if you can't trust those blockchains um, because they have security problems, uh, then you can't get anywhere. So blockchains need to be trustworthy first, 
And if they're trustworthy, perhaps we can build interesting security products on top of blockchain. So thank you. That's my talk. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions from the audience? If there are not, then we'll go straight through to the Slido. Okay, uh, first one. <clears throat> Vulnerabilities appear more because of the EVM bugs or because of the programmer mistakes? Uh, definitely the programmer mistakes. Um, so if there was a, um, so an EVM bug might refer to, uh, say, you know, Go Ethereum or Parity or some of other Ethereum client interpreting EVM bytecode incorrectly. Um, that hasn't happened on a large scale uh, so much, and the bytecode is rather simple. Um, it's kind of like Java bytecode; it's rather simple. So that is a possibility, but um, you know, it, it's much more the programmer's mistakes. Uh, next question, do you think WebAssembly will make smart contract more secure? I think I know where this question's coming from. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, um, I'm not, mm, let's see, so yes. Uh, I think really any kind of uh, language that is more security minded, um, you know, so Solidity was kind of born, so Solidity, the language that, um, most smart contracts are written in, was kind of born out of necessity and was uh, designed to be most, um, you know, they needed a language to build smart contracts in and they kind of rolled one real quickly. And they recognized that most people, uh, hip web 3.0 people like JavaScript, so they, they kind of coded it around uh, somewhat resembling JavaScript, although it's different in some key ways. Um, so, you know, it wasn't from the get-go, it wasn't a security focused uh, sort of language, um, and as you saw in some of the examples, there, you know, if you simply named your constructor function incorrectly, uh, then you would have totally unintended behavior inside of your contract that lived on the chain that anybody can exploit. Um, you know, those sorts of things, uh, those sorts of foot guns, um, that, uh, you know, with with another language, perhaps WebAssembly or um, you know Viper is the one I go to. Um, you know, I think anybody's going to do a better job than Solidity. So, okay, what are the safe languages available for Ethereum? So, kind of just cover that. Um, I would, if you're starting out, so Viper is currently in beta, although they and that's Viper V Y P E R uh, for like Python. Um, if you're just starting out, uh, you know, I, I would encourage you to study both Solidity and Viper. Those are the main ones. Um, but, you know, if you're going to be coding smart contracts, I would encourage you to code them in Viper, although most are currently in Solidity. So if you want to take a look at what's currently out there, you kind of have to know Solidity. Okay. And how did EOS garner such support despite its core issues? <laughs> Namely, C++ is a primary language, perhaps lack of consumer knowledge regarding blockchain security or scalability of the product. Um, so a lot could probably be said on why EOS is popular. Um, it's, uh, you know, they, they did a lot, of, I, I guess I would say they did a lot of things right in terms of marketing uh, their blockchain, um, but I, there was there's kind of a tipping point in terms of, um, uh, you know, when people invested in or, you know, bought pre-sale tokens in EOS, uh, they wanted other people to buy more tokens, right? And, and EOS was structured such that their token sale was a rolling token sale over the course of a year, I believe, um, with discounts decreasing every week, something like that. Don't quote me. It's very, it's similar to that though. So they, you know, anybody that had put money in want, wanted other people to put money in the next week, right? They're gonna have a less favorable exchange rate and immediately whatever they put in, their their investment is going to be worth more. So it was kind of encouraging this sort of snowball effect where you had a lot of people online trying to get other people to buy EOS tokens. And this was back when, you know, they didn't even have a public implementation. Um, so C++ or otherwise, they just didn't have an implementation when they were doing, when they were doing this, at least initially. Um, and, 
Yeah, so I, I think it's I think it's primarily around the hype um, more than anything else. People wanting other people to buy U.S. tokens at a less favorable exchange rate than they were getting. I think that's really the core of it. Okay, all right, one just disappeared, but will security of Hyperledger Fabric any known attacks? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so th to be frank, I'm, I've studied Hyper, Hyperledger a bit less than Ethereum. Um, you know, what we're building at Polyswarm is, oops, sorry, is based on top of Ethereum. Uh, but Hyperledger, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot more customizable um, than Ethereum. You know, it's kind of, you can run it in a uh, private consortium sort of manner. You can run Ethereum that way as well, but not many people do that. But it's it's more geared toward that sort of enterprise-y, uh, less, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily geared for public uh, implementations of a public blockchain, right? You're not going to have random people mining a on a Hyperledger node, right? Hyperledger is going to be used as a building block to build what it is that you want to do in an enterprise environment. Um, so in terms of any known attacks, yeah, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some, but I don't, I, I'm not, I, I don't know offhand. I'd have to check. Um, will Python evolve to be a better tool for blockchain? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what's being asked by this question, but, uh, yeah, I, I interact with a blockchain environment using Python on a fairly regular basis. Um, Again, Viper is, it's, it's not based on Python. It's just trying to have Python-like syntax um, in, in the way that you write smart contracts. What's nice about Viper is it removes the ability to, for example, inline assembly. Uh, so in Solidity, you can actually, like in C, you can drop to inline assembly. Uh, in the case of Solidity, it's, it's assembly for um, the EVM assembler. Whereas, you know, in C, it would be assembly for, you know, the x86 assembler or whatever architecture you're building on. Uh, you can't do that in Viper. Um, and you can't do a lot of other things that are, that make it very difficult for formal analysis to make any kind of guarantees. So removing those sort of functionalities, um, is what is nice about Viper. Uh, but Python, I mean, I don't know. I like Python. <laughs> I'm not sure it needs to change much for blockchain, but, um, all right, so access to HSMs and advanced crypto tools or training is not equal across the world. Do you think that would change anytime soon? Uh, deep question, a bit more philosophical, I think. Um, oh, and another one popped up. So, yeah, not equal across the world. Um, no, I don't. I don't really think that'll change anytime soon. So if we're referring to HSMs in terms of ledgers, nanos, uh, the things that you put in data centers, um, you know, I don't really think that'll change much anytime soon. I, you know, that's more of an economic kind of question and also, you know, legal sort of question. Um, but, you know, even without having ledgers or nanos, you can always do things like having a cold storage wallet, right? You could you could write something down and put it in a safe. Um, you know, maybe you want to put part of your key in one safe and part of your key in another safe. I don't know, but ultimately, you know, these these devices, at least some of them, aren't aren't designed uh, to resist physical attacks anyway, right? So, um, it it would be nice if everyone around the world would have access to things like le ledgers and treasures, but I'm not sure what would be happening right now to change that. At the moment, unfortunately. I don't know what would be changing that. Okay, is Facebook Libra losing key partners an indication that more large projects are not doing well too? Good question. Um, so I think one of the reasons, oh, and perfect timing, I have 45 seconds left. One of the reasons Libra is losing uh, key partners is um, the implications of Libra are uh, pretty broad and um, pretty impactful from a monetary policy standpoint of a lot of governments, right? You don't really want to have a Facebook coin. Uh, they already have a lot of power in other sort of aspects, and allowing them to have power in that aspect as well is probably not something that's, um, 
you know, taken very, uh, it, it, not something that's welcomed by a lot of governments. And you'll notice a lot of the people pulling out of the Facebook Libra project are, you know, it was like Visa and MasterCard or MasterCard or something. You know, they're pulling out because, you know, these are real companies with real operations in real countries. And they're going to be pressured by those countries, right? So they don't want to, um, so ultimately, I, you know, it, what we're talking about here is a lot of tech companies and, you know, uh, banks, et cetera, coming together, trying to create a new currency. And world governments are kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, you know, that's kind of our purview. Um, so I'm not sure if that's an indication that other large projects are not doing so well either. I guess it kind of is a question of what are the other large projects doing? Um, if they're not trying to, you know, if they're not going to butt heads up against somebody that regulates the people <laughs> making the new coin, um, then maybe they would do better. But in this particular case, you know, they're, they're kind of running up against, um, you know, what is typically a government's sort of purview. So. I think that might be why that's happening. All right. Thank you, Paul Mikulski. Okay. Can we please have a big, big applause for him?